For years, we have known that environmental factors can also play tricks on our minds. Thanks to the work of Dr. Michael Persinger, a scientist with Ontario's Laurentian University, we now know that magnetic fields can affect our cognitive perception. In a laboratory experiment, Persinger and his colleagues were able to provoke strange experiences in their test subjects' minds simply by stimulating them with irregular magnetic fields. What we find is that if between 2 and 4 o'clock in the morning there is the appropriate magnetic stimulation, it could be from geomagnetic activity or from something regional such as strain, and it stimulates the right hemisphere in particular, people have a sensed presence. They suddenly wake up and they feel there's an entity nearby. They may actually feel uh, uh, stimulations of their body. Men tend to experience uh, anal stimulation, women uterine stimulation, and the reason is because the area of the brain that's stimulated is involved with the internal states, with the uterus, with the internal states. You feel like you're floating. You may actually have the sensation of a, of a presence touching you. And it's usually on the left side of the body, incidentally, if it's negative. And it is very, very powerful, more so than even a waking dream. But remember, the brain is generating these experiences. The critical question is what's stimulating the brain to generate the experiences? The kind of information in the past is Persinger thinks that geological phenomena like underground springs or tectonic forces building up in the Earth's crust just before an earthquake can produce magnetic irregularities that help to explain some hallucinations. Well, one of the questions we, we've asked, we've been asked many times, is the kinds of patterns we apply to people in the laboratory. Do they occur in nature? And the answer is yes, they do, because that's where we got them. We've actually gone out into the field where people have experienced haunts or have been abducted. We record the magnetic disturbances, which are usually transient. They're not there all the time. And we record them on our equipment. Stan Corin and I very often go out and record them on fancy equipment. Bring them back, digitize them, and then apply them to the brain and produce the same experiences. Thus, in a naturally occurring process, our environment becomes dotted with these irregular magnetic fields that could cause a person coming into contact with them to enter an imaginary world. In Persinger's opinion, hallucinations resulting from magnetic stimulation could help to explain a large number of strange phenomena, from UFOs to so-called haunted houses. Well, one thing we do know is that tectonic strain, strain building up before an earthquake, is distributed along earthquake faults, very often along riverbeds or creek beds, on the top of hills, and a variety of unusual phenomena can be generated. Balls of light are simply one. Also, ultrasound can be generated, which very often rats or uh, dogs can hear. Sometimes odd smells are generated. Sometimes if you have a Peltier phenomena, you get a decrease in temperature locally or sometimes an increase in spontaneous fires. If you happen to be unfortunate enough to walk through these fields, it's going to stimulate your brain directly. And very often, people experience a haunt. And in our research, we find that wherever you have luminous phenomena showing up, so-called UFO flap, you also have an increase of all kinds of other parapsychological phenomena. Haunts, poltergeist reports, basically strange things in general become more frequent, including mundane things like more light bulbs burned out, more alternators in your cars burned out, cars not st starting, uh, more anomalous behavior by humans, for example, more suicidal behaviors from uh, protracted depression. These things often occur in clusters. Applying this theory of irregular magnetic fields to ghost research doesn't help to explain everything, far from it. Persinger's theories remain highly controversial for several reasons. The only problem is that it, it tends to be uh, single causation and simplistic. Uh, the whole panoply of ghosts is one of the most complex and intriguing tapestries I've ever run across. So you always see little scientists here and there darting across to explain this away and that away. And yet the whole uh, fabric still stands. They're not doing it. Uh, Persinger may partially be right, but it's only a small part of the puzzle.
Neuroscience has shown that stimulating a certain area of the brain causes the subject to hear music. That doesn't mean that all music comes from electrical stimulation of the brain, and musicians don't really exist. Persinger's theory also doesn't explain how several people are able to see the same ghost. I took Persinger's study to Skeptics Canada, uh, which is a Toronto-based group of uh, skeptics, uh, who honestly, in my opinion, for the most part, most of their membership are doubters. They want better data, they want better information. And I put it to them, what do you think of uh, the idea that high ambient electromagnetic fields would cause temporal lobe hallucinations and therefore someone to assume that a house is haunted? And the end result was that a lot of people there with electrical experience said to have the right set of controls in place to cause this would be next to impossible. Effectively, they were skeptical of Persinger's own study, which I found rather unique. Uh, our own studies where we've gone to haunted locations and taken uh, cold readings, mean readings, and control readings of uh, ambient EM uh, fields have absolutely shown no correlation at all so far to uh, hauntings and electromagnetic fields having anything to do with each other whatsoever. Research into hauntings hasn't resulted in any definitive answers to the manifestations. The introduction of new technologies and the understanding of naturally occurring phenomena have paved the way for a few explanations. Without, however, closing the door on the possibility that the manifestations may come from the spirit world, the debate is still going strong. In January 1970, an apartment in St. Catharines, Ontario became the stage for a series of extraordinary incidents. The St. Catharines poltergeist is one that I myself haven't studied. It's uh, very well known in the business, so to speak, among the psychical researchers and others. A house on Church Street in St. Catharines uh, was the scene of uh, domestic disturbances and the police are loath to investigate domestic disturbances until they learn that it involved a young boy. So a number of police officers of the Niagara Regional Police appeared at this house and discovered some strange things happening. For instance, doors were opening and shutting by themselves. The electric power supply was fine, except that when the young kid was in the room, the lights would dim and grow bright again. Noises were heard, and when the constables or officers investigated, they found nothing. For weeks, John and Barbara Page and their 11-year-old son, Peter, had succeeded in keeping the strange events out of the media. But on February 12, 1970, the local newspaper, The Standard, spread the story on its front page. This, in turn, led to a real media circus. Everyone wanted to know more about these inexplicable phenomena. The pages found the situation unbearable. They left St. Catharines and went to live in Montreal. While they were in Montreal, they didn't notice anything unusual happening, whether Peter was around or not. When they returned to their apartment on Church Street, Everything seemed to be back to normal. The strange occurrences seemed to have stopped completely. The pages did not report any other unusual incidents.